thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. On this episode, I'm excited to have Steve Matsky of CP Kelco. Steve Matsky is Senior Manager of Pioneering Innovation for CP Kelco, a global provider of nature-based ingredients, and he's based in San Diego. Steve received a master's degree in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley and has spent the majority of his career in process development and the manufacturing of fermentation-derived ingredients. He has intimate knowledge of large-scale fermentation processes and has spent significant time in all three of CP Kelco's fermentation manufacturing sites in the U.S. and China. His current focus is in the alternative protein space and how CP Kelco can contribute to this evolving foodscape. CP Kelco has nearly 90 years of experience serving food, beverage, and consumer product manufacturers worldwide. The company unlocks nature-powered success and applies innovation and problem-solving to develop tailored solutions for its customers. Pectin, gel and gum, and citrus fiber are among the nature-based ingredients in CP Kelco's portfolio. Learn more at cpkelco.com. I learned so much and had a great time chatting with Steve. Let's jump right in. Steve, I'd like to welcome you to the Future Food Show. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be on Future Food Podcast with you and really appreciate the invitation to participate. Steve, tell us a little bit about your background and your role at CP Calco. Okay, I'll, first off, I'll start with my background. So I'm trained as a chemical engineer. And as you may know, what we do as chemical engineers is take lab scale ideas, lab scale processes, and turn them into commercially viable large scale processes. I've been doing that for almost 30 years now in process development scale up and, and mainly in the area of fermentation process, scale up and process development. I'm also quite experienced in terms of large scale fermentation. CP Kelco obviously is heavily involved in fermentation as a commercial process. I've spent time at all three of our fermentation facilities in the US and China over the years. So I'm quite familiar with large scale fermentation as well. CP Kelco as a company has been around for close to 90 years. We produce nature-based ingredient solutions from fermentation, as I already talked about, as well as extraction from plants such as seaweed and citrus fruits. And all these products are used in foods and beverages, primarily for stabilization, special texture, and viscosity. My current role is in a relatively new group at CP Cocoa, which is called Pioneering Innovation. I've been in that group for the last couple of years. And what our role is in that group is to envision the future That is to explore new technologies, innovations, collaborations that will fuel the future growth of CP Kelco. My job specifically now is in the area of the alternative protein space and to explore that space and how CP Kelco might contribute. And when it comes to large scale, how large is large scale? Is there a metric for kind of the size of how big the large scale gets? That's a good question. I can't say exactly how big our tanks are, but if you think about if you've ever been to a a large commercial brewery in the U.S., the size of those tanks, we're talking in general in the hundreds of thousands of liters capacity is what I would refer to as large scale. Okay. And that's pretty large. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Their story's high and they're large tanks. So I want to jump into the history of fermentation and really get to the basics. So what is an explanation of fermentation as it relates to food? And and where does the story really start? The story of fermentation itself starts thousands of years ago. We know that fermentation was used by ancient civilizations all over the world, from Asia to Africa, Egypt, Europe. Early on, it was used as a way to preserve foods and beverages. And from what we can gather, it probably just started by accident with some yeast or some other wild microbe finding its way into grape juice or milk or grain or something like that and growing. And then the people either realizing that, hey, this can preserve the food so we can eat it later, or it imparted a pleasant flavor to the food that made it better to eat. The warm climate probably had something to do with it too, or whatever climate it was where those people lived to foster the growth of those microorganisms. And if you think about it, every civilization around the world has some sort of fermented food or beverages, part of its food background and heritage. You can think of wine, beer, kimchi, sauerkraut, all those are are examples. In its simplest form, I would say that fermentation can be defined as some microbe converting sugar or some other carbon source into some desirable product, such as alcohol, in the case of wine or beer, or some other desirable 
consistency or flavor in the case of, say, yogurt or cheese. Those are some other examples. There are some narrow definitions of fermentation that relate that process only to an anaerobic or oxygen-free conversion of sugar. But I, I like to think of it in broader terms, in terms of uh, any process where a microbe would convert sugar or carbon source to a desirable product. Salt and other components also can play a role in this, as in the case of kimchi and sauerkraut. They would create conditions that favor certain bacteria or certain flavors, pull the water out and add some flavor, as I mentioned. And so you mentioned beer and, and wine as a kind of a traditional application. What are some future food applications that we're seeing today or modern applications? Yeah, so for modern food applications, we're starting to, to see protein being produced by fermentation. So now we think of alternative protein, maybe on a plant-based with pea and soy and other things like that. So we're starting to see protein produced by fermentation, as well as other specialty products that are used in this alternative protein space that are produced by fermentation. A CP Calco makes an important hydrocolloid called gelangum, which is made by fermentation. And that particular organism that we used to make gelan was discovered on lily plants in a lake in Pennsylvania some, oh, I would say, 40 years ago when we had a program at CP Calco around basically going around the world and searching for organisms in nature that produce this viscosity-enhancing gelling texture approach. And it's really, uh, gelling gum has become an essential ingredient in plant-based milks. If you look at a lot of the, uh, the almond milks and flax milks and some other milks, alternative milks on the market, a lot of them have gel as a stabilizer and viscosity mouthfeel enhancer. I'm often asking the question, how much of this future food technology is a matter of engineering versus scientific discovery. And this is a really good example of scientific discovery being part of the process. That's really cool. Yeah, it was, like I say, I've been around for a long time, but even that program was even before my time. It was an interesting thing to be going around the world and, and basically just collecting samples of bacteria from soil and from lakes and from even extreme environments like uh, in Yellowstone, some hydrothermal areas and such. So it's, uh, it was really an interesting time of discovery, like you say. We talked about alternative proteins as it relates to fermentation. I've been hearing the term precision fermentation quite a bit. Is that directly related? And can you shed some light on what precision fermentation is, not just as a technology, but also where the terminology might have come from? Yeah, I, I think it's best to sort of summarize the whole fermentation space of which precision fermentation is one part. So I agree with the Good Food Institute has done a lot of work in this area, and they've said that fermentation is a pillar of the alternative protein industry and could revolutionize this space. And I completely agree with that. And they do a good job of categorizing fermentation in the context of alternative protein, and they divide it up into three categories. Firstly, traditional fermentation. This is where live organisms are used to sort of modulate and process plant-derived ingredients, resulting in products that have uh, different nutritional profiles, texture, flavors, etc. This is kind of what we talked about earlier in the podcast when we we're talking about cheese, yogurt, kimchi, and sauerkraut. That would be traditional fermentation. The second category that GFI uses is biomass fermentation. And in that fermentation, you actually leverage the fast growth and the high protein content of certain microorganisms so that you can actually just grow the protein itself in the fermenter. Examples here would be fungi and algae, where the, like I said, the biomass itself serves as the predominant ingredient as one of the several ingredients in a blend, for example. And then finally, the question you asked specifically, there's a category called precision fermentation. And precision fermentation is where the fermentation is used to produce specific functional ingredients that are most of the time incorporated at lower levels in finished products. So these functional ingredients would be enablers for improved sensory textural properties of plant-based products. Again, I mentioned CP Calco's gel and gum earlier. It's an example here where the gel and gum is produced by fermentation used at small amounts in alternative protein products and gives the product a new textural property. Another example would be the heme protein which you may have heard of that's used in the Impossible Burger, sort of to give that blood, meaty sort of cooking experience as well as flavor. And other examples of the precision fermentation products would be things like vitamins or plants. There's almost an endless selection, really, of molecules that you could choose from. 
mentioned vitamin B12 as an example in our gel and gum. These products are already widely used in the food industry. And that's one of the key strengths, I think, of CP Calco is our ability to scale up and manufacture many of these functional ingredients. And as a company, I would say that we're most closely aligned with what we're talking about here is precision fermentation. And I don't know if you can speak to this, but the company Perfect Day, I believe, has been using the term precision fermentation. Is that kind of a similar technology as to what's going on with the heme protein? Yeah, Perfect Day using a precision fermentation process. And I guess to take a step back, these animal-based proteins are very unique in their function in things like ice cream and milk and things. So Perfect Day has decided to make those unique molecules by fermentation to get that ice cream to be more like dairy ice cream without actually using a cow to make the dairy part of it, if that makes sense. And that would fall into the precision fermentation category. That would definitely fall here. And again, if you think about it, these are products produced by fermentation that are used at lower levels. It's not the main protein source, at least in this case, of those products that they're making, but it imparts texture or flavor or sensory, I would say sensory aspects to that product that makes it closer to the animal-based version. Well, this was a very good overview of traditional biomass and precision fermentation. And it seems within the area of fermentation, we are seeing these kind of classic technologies being used and also these modern technologies being used. I want to ask, at what stage of the process does CP Calco get involved with food technology companies? Do you work with startups? Is it only during the scale-up process? What's the typical workflow? We partner with customers early on generally when they're making either prototypes and we sort of have different ways depending on the customers we do with how we work with them but we can help to solve formulation challenges in terms of our applications laboratories and then for the specific companies that are looking at the fermentation that's where i think cp calco has a real specific advantage i would say since we have a pilot plant and a lot of expertise in the fermentation technology area that we can help with there. We also have innovation labs and R&D experts that are based worldwide. And those labs are specific, as you know, the food taste and things are specific to regions of the world. So we have these labs in various locations throughout the world to hone in on the particular local food side of things. And then on the business side, we know quite a bit about the regulatory landscape and the market. And the great thing about using fermentation-derived ingredients is the sort of repeatability. If you're talking about plant-based things, you have to deal with things like weather and other things that might impact the protein. But on the fermentation side, it's a pretty controlled process that you can control that way. And from a regulatory standpoint, it seems like it's a lot faster to get to regulatory approvals and safety or even meeting grass criteria than things like cell-cultured meat, which is something that is a new novel technology that's really still up in the air in terms of regulation. Yeah, we've, like I said, you know, we've been around for a while, so we've gone through all the regulatory grass and such that you mentioned with a lot of our products. And with cell-based meat, you know, what complicates that is you're not only dealing with the FDA, but you're also dealing with the USDA. So you have two government bodies that you have to deal with to, to work in that space. In the US, that's the case, but recently in Singapore, they got some cell-based meat through the regulatory process there, and the people are already eating it over there. So although the U.S. might be challenging at times, there's other places in the world that uh, may be a little bit more open regulatory-wise for these types of things. When it comes to fermentation, do you think consumers are actively thinking about fermentation when they are making purchasing decisions? I mean, of course, when you are purchasing kimchi or sour cream, you think about it, but if there was like a new type of product that is not typically made with fermentation, if the consumer kind of is purchasing that, what do you think about what consumers are thinking? Is it a factor? Consumers in general have a basic understanding of fermentation, but, and like you say, they buy sauerkraut and kimchi and those types of things, knowing that fermentation is involved. But for other things, unless we call it out on the label, or I wouldn't think they're probably thinking too much about it. The good news though, I think is that most consumers have a think of fermentation in good terms, in terms of a traditional, natural, perhaps healthy process. So we have that part of the story as a good one. And 
that good story could be used to connect maybe some of these new, less known products that are going to come out and make them sound somewhat more appetizing if we can attach that fermentation label to it. I think it's up to us really, not just CP Calco, but as an industry to get that message out that what fermentation is, how it's a natural process, et cetera. And, and then people will uh, perhaps start buying products based on that. Yeah, that's a good point. And I do have a positive recognition of the concept of fermentation. And for me personally, maybe it comes down to fermentation being used to store things for longer in a safe environment. So I think about safety specifically when I think about fermentation, or even you use the word healthy. I do think that fermented foods are healthy foods, going back to kimchi and sauerkraut. Yeah. And that's, again, all those examples you just mentioned are traditional fermentation and where the industry or where the technology maybe is changing or what's moving forward is finding maybe the right ingredients that produce by, like we talked about, precision fermentation that will help and with these plant-based foods and resonate with customers in terms of them being interested in buying them. A key to any of this plant-based food that we're looking at now is that, you know, it's got to taste good and it's got to look good and it's got to be close to the sort of traditional animal-based products. Otherwise, people won't really be interested. I I guess I'm talking mainly about what we call flexitarians in this case, but consumers are really sensitive to taste, texture, aroma, and the way their food looks. People are posting pictures of food on Instagram. And if we want to get into that space, we have to make that food look appetizing and really have to start, you know, working on the sensory part of it. How would you say fermentation and food technologies is changing? Really, what's next for the industry? And we have three categories now. Would there be a fourth category that's being developed in terms of scientific discovery or technology? What's really next for fermentation? Yeah, I'd say that fermentation in this space is in a great exploration phase. We talked about protein being made by fermentation. I think that's being done right now, but it's really not from products on the shelves. It's not something that is widely available. Most of what you're seeing today in the plant-based either dairy or meat space is based on pea, soy, wheat, some of those other things. So I think there's still a lot of room to grow there in terms of the protein produced by fermentation, either be that fungi or algae. In terms of the categories, I'm not sure we're going to see a fourth category of fermentation type ingredients. I think the biggest category for exploration is that in that precision fermentation area where, like I said earlier, really you can use microorganisms as mini factories to make just about any product you want. And as we learn more about what's needed in the space of plant-based products, we'll know more about what type of molecules might be beneficial. And again, it, it all comes back to making those foods taste good, have a good texture, and really be able to compete with the animal-based products that are on the market today. And I'm thinking about fermentation as it relates to cellular agriculture or more specifically acellular agriculture. Clara Foods, I think, is using yeast and turning that into egg using precision fermentation. Is that correct? Yeah, they're making that by precision fermentation for sure. And if you were doing that same process, but you were not replacing like an animal protein or animal product, would that still fall under precision fermentation? Or would that then be biomass fermentation? Good question. And at least the way I look at precision fermentation, any sort of product that's used in smaller amounts or made specifically to enhance properties. I mean, I guess you could look at it, you know, our gel and gum is not really an animal product. That was a product that was a bacteria in the wild was making. And we've had a lot of success scaling that up, but its function is more around making those products texturally better to eat. So in that case, I I would consider non-animal based products to be part of precision fermentation. Would you consider that precision fermentation could be divided to two categories, one being the acellular agriculture category where we're working on animal based proteins, and then another category that doesn't replace any animal, yeah, anything from animal origin? Yeah, and I think you could do that. You talked about Perfect Day and Clara Foods, and those are obviously companies that are working on the sort of animal-based, and that's one category you could say. But again, you could look at our company making the enablers to enable products to be better tasting or 
Yeah, I guess you could even bring sort of small flavor components into that. That's not in our in CP Calco's world, but there are companies that make flavor ingredients and by fermentation as well. That might be another non-animal based thing that could be brought into that section where you split off the animal and the, the non-animal based in the world of precision fermentation. You can get in touch with Steve on LinkedIn and learn more about CP Calco at www.cpkelco.com. Steve, do you have any last insights or announcements for our audience today? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for having me on here, Alex. I think it was a great conversation. If any of your listeners want to learn more, talk more about fermentation and CP Coco and anything uh, around scalability, feel free to reach out. If you have a great idea, we at CP Coco have an amazing experience team and we're definitely willing to help help you innovate and launch products. We've worked with a lot of companies around the world and we're passionate about nature-based success and would be uh, very open to working together there. Steve, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insight on the Future Food Show. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.